Let's see if we can find a few more seats and then go. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this gorgeous afternoon. Today we celebrate elegance and eloquence in light of a search for equality. Today we celebrate Helen Clater. Today we celebrate history and today we celebrate community and the good fortune of this community thanks to Joan and Peter Secchia and their family. Good afternoon, I'm Joseph Becker. I'm the chairperson of Grand Rapids Community Legends. And some of you might know me from my work at Meyer Gardens and my teaching at Aquinas College, but it's a uh, real joy and honor to participate uh, in this project. On behalf of our Community Legends committees and the Secchia family, as well as Mayor George Hartwell, I just saw George a second ago, and Grand Rapids Community College and their president, Stephen Elder. I want to thank you for attending this important community event. This is a very special day. We celebrate the unveiling of the sixth sculpture in the Community Legends series, that of Helen J. Clater. The Secchia family began their investment and interest in this important historic and cultural series about seven years ago. The idea behind the project was to help each of us today and well into the future better understand the history of our community. It's intended to help us appreciate those that walked before us and those that made a difference locally, regionally, and frequently nationally. As Community Legends was established, two groups were formed, the History Committee, who work to decide which figures will be honored and the Arts Committee, which go through many, many, many portfolios of sculptors and decide which artists will create the images that you'll see. And we have several of those committee members here today. If you want to just raise your hand and wave, thank you all for your efforts and your volunteering. Each of these sculptures captures a likeness, and we believe also a spirit, and they are intended to inspire us all. But the site also allows us the opportunity to read about our history. And if you travel to any of the Community Legends sites, you'll see multiple plaques that articulate who this individual was, what they accomplished, what they gave to the community. It tells us a little bit about the artist as well. It provides for our curiosity. It provides for our cultural enrichment. Our first sculpture was Lucius Lyon, followed by Chief Nauquijic, then J. Van Andel, Bishop Frederick Berriga, and then just last year, Mayor Lyman Parks. It's extraordinary what a difference that this has made to the history and to the culture of this community in such a short period of time. Again, thank you, Joan, Peter, and family. As you see here today, each of the sculptures is intended to connect with a relevant area within the downtown, a place where the individual who's being honored may have walked, may have spent their life. This is a very important spot because just a few blocks away is the YWCA, which played a major role in the life of the Clater family. It's right here on the campus of Grand Rapids Community College, which is so well known and well respected for their commitment to diversity and to equality. And for daughter Judith, I think it has an extra meaning because it's just right around the corner from her church. <laughs> As I've mentioned, these wonderful sculptures have been donated by the Secchia family. The landowner, in this case, Grand Rapids Community College, becomes the recipient of the gift. Lucius Lyon was dedicated to the city of Grand Rapids, Chief Nalakwijic, also known as Chief Noonday, to Grand Valley State University. <clears throat> Jay Van Andel stands in front of the arena and was donated to the Convention and Arena Authority. Bishop Barriga was donated to the Catholic Diocese of Grand Rapids and placed at the Cathedral Square and Mayor Parks was donated to the city of Grand Rapids and stands very proudly on Monroe. Grand Rapids Community College gift is special because this was the first organization that after the first project was unveiled, came right to Community Legends and said, we'd like to participate in this. We'd like to be a part of this. But could you wait? Because in just a few years, we're gonna be celebrating our 100th anniversary. And this is a milestone for the institution. It's a milestone for the community. And we're glad that this gift can come your way for such a birthday. Speaking of Grand Rapids Community College, I'd like to introduce their president, Stephen C. Ender, 
to accept this gift. Please join us. Well, thank you. On behalf of Grand Rapids Community College, our Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, and students, I would like to say what an honor it is for us and our campus to be selected as a site for this sculpture of Helen Claytor. It seems to me entirely appropriate that this, that this particular work be placed here in the Grand Rapids Community College. Ms. Claytor graduated from the University of Minnesota, cum laude, cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa in 1928, but quickly learned that jobs were few and far between for black teachers. So she reinvented herself and devoted her life to social advocacy. She turned our city and our nation into her classroom. She committed her life to educating all of us about tolerance and the importance of civil rights. Mrs. Claytor's story, especially as GRC celebrates our 100th anniversary, will encourage our students as they seek to change the injustices they see in this world. And I would like to thank the Sakia Family Foundation for funding this tribute to her. Partnerships. Partnerships with community-minded organizations like the Sakia Family Foundation have built and enriched our college throughout the past century. And we are delighted and honored to have this sculpture serve as an inspiration and a signpost as we embark on our next 100 years. Thank you, John and Peter. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, an artist, a sculptor, and now I think a very dear friend, Jay Hall Carpenter. Many of you probably have uh, read something about Jay's work. Um, he created hundreds of images for the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. before he embarked on an independent career. His images can be found across the United States, and most recently he was responsible for the image of Bishop Berga, which I mentioned a few moments ago. Please join me in welcoming a very, very fine artist and a delightful human being to the podium. Jay? Thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, begin by thanking Ambassador Sekia and Joe Becker for their vision, their dedication to Grand Rapids, and their appreciation of the achievements of women. Why women in particular? I've been a sculptor for 38 years, and with the exception of religious statuary, this is the first public monument I've ever been asked to sculpt of a woman. Yeah. <laughs> if one looks through the streets of Florence or Rome or my home city of Washington, D.C., you will find sculptures of women as beautiful allegorical figures or perhaps damsels in need of rescue by men, but rarely are they depicted as historic individuals celebrated for their achievements. Grand Rapids is quietly addressing this imbalance. Rosa Parks, eventually Ann Bissell, and others, and today Helen Clater are honored here for their vision, their principles, and their successes. Bravo. It has been a true privilege getting to know Helen Clater through the photographs and stories generally, uh, generously offered by her daughters. Even artifacts from her life were lent to me so that the sculpture might benefit from these touchstones. But bronze has its limits. It cannot adequately convey Helen's energy and vivacity, nor her love of color. When you see the sculpture unveiled, I'd like you to imagine her working an event in a beautiful, vibrant pink suit. The, the suit many of you are remembering right now. The same suit that graced my studio for five months and made me smile every day of the project. The delicate wristwatch depicted is the one she wore often. The shoes reflect her preference for low high heels, as she called them. Her wedding ring. These are the details of how she presented herself to the world as she quietly diplomatically went about changing it 
and us irrevocably for the better. Thank you. Every project like this has its uh, joys, and two joys for all of us that have been involved with this image of Miss Clater has been the opportunity to interact with her family, and in particular, her daughters. So if I could please ask Judith Clater and Helen, excuse me, and Sharon Clater-Peters to come to the podium. While we just sat and tried to decide who would go first, Judith is my big sister, and I always do what my big sister said. I told her this is her show. She's here in Grand Rapids, and she told me to go first. <laughs> Many people in this audience knew our mother, and you know that mother never, never started a talk without a good story. And I didn't have one. I am not nearly as charming as Helen Clater. But in walking over here, we figured out one. When Helen was, when Mama was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, our son Troy was about three or four, and our daughter Shawnee was one or two. Well, there's a lot of hoopla about the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, as there should be. And we lived in Lansing. And people would have mother come over for openings and events and the dinner and the this and the that. So she came to visit often. And one day, our son Troy looked at her. He called her Yu Yu. That's a whole nother story. I, he called her Yu Yu. He looked at her and he said, Yu Yu, when are you going to get through with your fame? Well, I can tell you now, in bronze, Troy, never. <laughs> she is here. Troy's right over here. Shawnee's right over here, our wonderful family. What a beautiful day. Judith and I, our brother Roger Wilkins, who couldn't be here today because of illness, and our entire family all thank all of you for coming, for being here with us today. But we especially thank the Secchia family. The Secchia family and all of you who have been involved in this project, this most extraordinary project. We are just so humbled by the fact that you all have made it possible for our mother to be remembered in this way, to really be brought back in this way. It's something we just couldn't imagine, and we can't thank you enough. A few days ago, my husband, who used to, you remember my mother was a stickler for grammar, and she and my husband used to spend all kinds of time fixing up people's language and coming up with words. So we were thinking about words that described mama. And the words that ended up topping our list were genteel and warrior. Well, after that, we had to laugh, because most people don't put genteel and warrior together. But if you knew Helen Clater, she did. Without a doubt, mother was gracious, elegant, and charming. Many here remember the, her in a, engaging ways, and as I said, the warmth and humor of her stories, whether you heard them in her public speeches or around her dining room table. She was charming. But they also remember that that genteel lady was focused and determined when it came to social justice. She was unwavering. She lived by and often stated her credo, and I will quote, I will work as though the coming of the kingdom of God depends on me. And you know her, you were in meetings with her. She was doing God's work, and she wasn't going to stop. She'd be charming, she'd tell stories, she'd do, 
she, she, but she was not going to stop. Her lifelong focus was on the well-being of women and girls and on equal rights for all people. And I did a little reading, Judith and I did, and we saw that there weren't, this is one of the very few statues, full statues of a woman that'll ever be in, Mich that's in Michigan. So it's so fitting. With that fight, Twink Fry is here, Carla Blinkhorn, her, her sisters in the women's movement are right here to know how special it is to have her once again lead for women in becoming a bronze statue. <laughs> oh. From the Harlem Renaissance, which she touched and was involved in, to the Civil Rights Movement, which she was involved in, she was a part of an impactful time in the 20th century. And she made an impact on this community and far beyond. For me, her unwavering commitment expresses itself most in two areas, that is faith and family. The C in the YWCA was not just another letter to mother. Her Christian faith carried through in everything she did and her value of family never wavered either. I was not only lucky, we were not only lucky to have her as our mother, but we were lucky, being late life babies, that she lived so long. And her commitment to family was the rock that helped me when I ran across some of the rough spots that life throws at you. It helped me keep family uppermost, commitment to family. That was mother. Her partner in her life in Grand Rapids was our dad, Dr. Robert Clater, who instilled those values right along with her, maybe ahead of her. He served and literally saved lives. Some of you have talked to me here about what he did for you and your family. He saved lives, especially in the black community, which had precious few care options before he moved here. In fact, a friend of mine, who, my fa who our father delivered into this world a long time ago, called me up the other day, and he said, well, Sharon, why aren't they Putting, why aren't they putting up a statue of your father? And I laughed, and well, that's appropriate. Well, I'll tell you, when this, when this uh, veil comes off, we will know that when I look at this sculpture, I will know that she is not standing up there alone. Dad is there with her, as always, standing quietly right behind her, propping her up and propelling her on in all her good works that enriched this community, our family, and the world. I will close by a last story that I'll have to save until she is unveiled. I talked to our brother just yesterday, and his request, which I will honor, is when you look at Mama, Blow her a kiss for me. So we will blow that kiss. We love you, Mama. And I love my big sister who is coming to the podium now, to the mic now. It is an honor to be here today with my sister to celebrate this occasion that has been made possible by the Secchia family in donating this statue in Mama's memory, and thank the committee for nominating her for this particular um, honor. And I thank all of you who are here, so many friends and sorority sisters and church members and YWCA folks, and I just can't go through all the list of connections. However, um, I want to pick up where Sharon left off and mention yet another family member who's here, our cousin Ruth. And Ruth 
Ruth's family figures very much into why Mama ended up in Grand Rapids. Right. And um, when she was doing work for the YWCA and as a professional staff member, she did a study with a white colleague of all the associations of the YWCA, or most of them, throughout the country. And it was an interracial, interracial study to um, find out what kinds of practices were going on. And when they traveled in the South, Mama was not able to stay in any hotels, and so they had to rely on um, African American or colored or whatever they were called, whatever we were called in that time. But um, it was Ruth's family, her mother and father, who welcomed mom into their home in while she, in Virginia, in Roanoke, Virginia, while mama was doing that study. And so when she came here to Grand Rapids to um, discuss the study or continue with it. I'm not quite sure where she was in the process. Um, they had invited several community members so that there were some men there and some African Americans present at this speech she gave. And she met my father there and he looked just like Uncle John. He sure did. And so Mama asked daddy if he was Uncle John's son and he said no I'm his brother so basically she was interested in finding out more about or he was interested in finding more about how mama knew his brother and the rest you see is history <laughs> so um, that's how mama got here to Grand Rapids and her devotion and now it's in the YWCA it was in the yes. YWCA lobby Thank you. <laughs> That's what little sisters are all for, you know. <laughs> but at any rate, um, she, Daddy was so um, enthusiastic about the work Mama was doing. He had been um, involved in community work here in Grand Rapids, serving on community chess boards and one thing and another. And as they came together as a couple, they had a discussion which um, was that they wanted to decide how they were going to do things. And Daddy decided that she didn't need to work for pay. And so she took on the role of the volunteer activities, and he concentrated on making a living for the family. And so when she went to China to a World Council meeting when I was six months old, Daddy thought that was a fine idea. And made arrangements for that to happen. When Sharon was a little kid, um, mom's mother had died just before Sharon was born, so the arrangements were a little more complicated. But nonetheless, daddy helped make the arrangements so mother could go to a world council meeting in Lebanon. And so, again, daddy was always there supporting her. He was not the kind of man who was saying, oh no, you can't do this, you've got to stay home and watch the kids. It was a true partnership, and they were very much involved in working for freedom, justice, and equality for all human beings. And Mother's involvement with the YWCA, as Sharon said, really was a reflection of her Christian commitment. Because during the time when she became active in the YWCA, women did not have many opportunities for leadership in churches. And so many of them were able to express that commitment through the YWCA. And the National YWCA hired a number of Christian women theologians because there were not very many places for them to operate. And usually when the YWCA conventions happened in that period before women had so many opportunities in churches, we prepared for the conventions by reading theologians. I remember when I was 16, I was reading Paul Tillich. So, and that was a preparation to go to the YWCA convention because we had serious devotions and the whole 
thing was gathered, I mean, the, the Christian commitment was very much part of our work. And one of the things that mom lived by was reflected in one of the purposes that the YWCA has. Just like other organizations, YWCA changes their purpose every now and again. But one of the phrases in the YWCA purpose at the time when I was at a convention with her was, that we are going to respond to the barrier breaking love of God in this day. And that's what I feel that our mother was able to do in all the work she has done here in Grand Rapids because she helped to get the um, Community Relations Commission together and eventually the Equal Employment Opportunity Office. She worked on committees that were responsible for making sure that African-American teachers were employed to work in the public school system. And any number of those kinds of things happened. And she worked quietly and in concert with other people. It wasn't that she was off marching around by herself. So we're very, very happy to be here to celebrate our mother. It's very special. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, I want to thank Jay Hall Carpenter. He has been a wonderful friend through this process. We met him last, or I met him last summer, and it was a pleasure. I told you they were a joy. And uh, I'd like to, uh, and I'm honored to welcome Ambassador Sekia to the podium to say a few words. Uh, this whole project is his vision and much of his energy to make things happen. And it's happened six times already, and it's going to happen a few more times in the future. Ambassador Sekia. Well, I heard of those two ladies and their marvelous. Uh, it's hard to believe that they're talking about their mom when there were no African American teachers in. Grand Rapids, and today we have an African-American superintendent, woman who's here tonight with us, who we all just love, uh, has done a magnificent job in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. And when you talked about your, Sharon, you mentioned the young man who talked about you, you, we've got a yaya in our family. Yaya, stand up and wave to these people. Come on, come here, come on, stand up and wave. There you go. Look at the people behind you. Yaya lives in Shanghai, China, and she's here with her parents. Some of you might know her dad, Mark, and mother, Laurie Duffy, who came from Forest Hills. And then we have uh, Pietro and Bea. We're talking about family now. Pietro and Bea, please stand up. They're from Rome, Italy. Stand up here. Bea, Rome. Where's Pietro? Pietro. Pietro, once in a while go where you're supposed to go. He's Italian, what can I do? <laughs> then we have here three lovely ladies from Seattle. And here they are, Maggie Jane, and Thea, and Elsa. <laughs> from Seattle, Washington, came all the way in with their mother, Sandy. And of course, the other Rome kids, their father and mother, are, their father and mother are standing over there in the shade also laughing at me sitting here in the sun. But, and then last but not least, who did I forget? Oh, I forgot Stephanie, who had now has brought us Julia and Vivi's home napping. But they're here from New York City. And their husband, their father, Ken Oler. But I gotta tell you, bringing family together isn't easy as you are trying to schedule for this. And it is part of what the Christian faith teaches us all. Family is most important. And I think that by coming to community college, where I've been fortunate enough to be involved for years with the Culinary Institute, is exciting to go to Steve Ender and offer this gift from our family, which will become the property of the university, be carried on their balance sheet as an asset, and something we're very proud to do. Uh, we love our family, but we love our community. We love the West Michigan work ethic. We love the entrepreneurism. We love the fairness. We love the honesty. We love clean government, and we're proud of the clean government we, that we have here, and we work hard for that. And this statue is to remind us of the people who worked before we got here to take our job. 
They were here before us. And if you don't know who you were, how do you know who you're going to be? And Helen Clater is an example of who we were, and we have to proudly recognize her for what she did. And as the first female statue in Grand Rapids, other than Rosa Parks, I, I don't know if there's another. Rosa Parks is sitting down. That doesn't count as a stand-up statue, huh? Uh, she's standing up, I don't know. All I do is walk around and look at all of the statues. We're up now to we have a, probably have a dozen downtown, more to come. And thank you all for being here today and we'll be unveiling this momentarily. Okay, if we could get the Clater sisters, President Ender, Jay, We'll do the unveiling. Are we ready, Michael? Here we go. One, two, three. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us, and stay tuned for what Community Legends has in store next.